uh, to the ceiling, and I believe it was 3M that invented the, the gecko tape by mimicking the, the gecko. We used some of the examples of the abalone shell, which is a high-tech uh, ceramic, but yet this is the ceramics factory. And these are the results. So often it's asked, why is, somewhat tongue-in-cheek, why are there no green geology or green astronomy? But the answer is a serious one, because chemistry, unlike the other natural sciences, both seeks to understand the world as it is, but it also is the creative or the creating side of, of chemistry, which introduces new substances into the world. And because it introduces new substances into the world, it has a responsibility for the consequences of those substances in the world. So let's take a look at sustainability. Sustainability you can't think about in terms of let's be sustainable until next Tuesday or next year. You need to take at least a centuries long time frame. And so if you were a resource planner in 1909 and you were saying let's be sustainable for a century, you'd say we'd need enough whale oil for lighting, you'd need enough wood for fuel, you'd want to have enough rock salt for refrigeration, and certainly enough horses for transportation. But of course that's not the way the world went. Uh, in the U.S. alone, the amount of land that's used to feed horses has, has plummeted until we stopped keeping these records because they were no longer relevant. The, the wood is a fuel source plummeted because it became irrelevant and we no longer kept the records. In other words, science and technology intervened to change the equation. A good friend of mine likes to say, the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. Science and technology intervenes to change the equations and gets us off an unsustainable technology, that, an unsustainable trajectory that we're on. So when we look at the major challenges of sustainability, anyone in this room can come up with their own, their own list, but I think folks would agree that these are at least among some of the top, uh, some of the top examples. So. As we look at these, we have to think about what uh, the words of John F. Kennedy would say, and that is that the great enemy of the truth is very often not the lie, deliberate, contrived, and dishonest, but the myth, persistent, persuasive, and realistic. The myth that we are living with today is that you cannot have economic development, you cannot have increased quality of life, you cannot have modern conveniences, without the use of toxic substances. Green chemistry is belying that myth every day. And let's talk a little bit about that. So we'll start with energy. We know that right now the vast majority of energy used in the world is petroleum-based, fossil-based. And that means depleting finite resources. We know about the greenhouse gases the effects of mining and drilling, and the common toxics that are produced along with it. Now this is the projection for increased energy growth. It is unlikely that if we are going to see the kind of development that we need to see in the world, that the absolute amount of energy is going to decrease. There will be more energy used. The projections for what that energy portfolio is going to be look something like this. You could call this more of the same. Oil, natural gas, and coal. What green chemistry is doing and what the work of green chemists around the world is doing is to make this projection wrong. To make sure that the trajectory as, as so many times in the past we have needed to rise the occasion and have done, that these trajectories change. So in energy, green chemistry is and will be essential in both developing the alternatives for energy generation, whether it be in 
the next generation photovoltaics and hydrogen fuel cells, biodiesel fuels, all of these alternatives will require that green chemistry play an essential role. Because it is very possible to do the right things, come up with alternative energy sources, and do them wrong. If we develop bio-based sources of energy and it competes with food and feed, if we develop photovoltaics that are toxic and depleting, we will be doing the right things and doing them wrong. And so having this essential green chemistry perspective and using the green chemistry design framework will hopefully give us greater assurance that we're doing the right things right. In addition, green chemistry will be continuing on making sure that our current uh, processes that consume energy are as efficient as possible so using things such as next generation catalysis. Global change, some people say global warming. I, I often prefer to use the uh, phrase climactic chaos because the truth is that some places will get warmer, some places will get cooler, some places will get drier, and some places will get wetter. That's what happens when you add more energy to a to a system. So when we look at the, the current state of affairs, I'm sure everyone in this room has seen these charts that uh, over the past thousand years uh, we've seen the dramatic uh, recent increase since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. We've seen the, the uh, CO2 concentrations and we've seen the emissions grow over time. Well, there may be many useful scientific debates about rates of change, the roles of clouds and water vapor, the various reliability of different parameters and models. One thing is no longer a, uh, uh, a worthwhile scientific debate, and that is whether or not our emissions, our CO2 levels, and our temperatures are increasing. And so I, I give you this one example of, uh, of green chemistry. And that is about uh, an alternative fire retardant that moved away from CFC, moved away from hal halons, and a fire extinguishing agent. CFCs, of course, being a tremendously potent uh, greenhouse gas, orders of magnitude more potent than CO2, many orders of magnitude more potent. And this moved away by using surfactants to make water a more powerful fire extinguishing agent. Well, you might say, well, that's, that's nice. It's good for the environment. But the thing that I want to put out, point out is on the last line, that it was used on a large oil, oil tank of fire that took place in the Bosphorus Straits. And the insurance company Lloyds of London projected that it would take 10 days to put out this oil tank of fire, and it did put it out in 12 and a half minutes. The point is that green chemistry needs to and will be more effective in its performance in addition to being environmentally benign and sustainable. Those two things need to be coupled in order to have the type of transformation that we're talking about. But of course, if all of the fire extinguishing agents that we make in the world uh, were not using halons anymore, that wouldn't scratch the surface of our gigaton problem on CO2. And in many ways we have to change the equation of not looking on CO2 as a waste to be released into our environment. Now there's wonderful scientific work being used to make CO2 into materials and, and plastics. But we have the same scale problem there. How do we start thinking about uh, using CO2 so that you sequester it in every bit of cement and concrete, every bridge, every road, every, every surface, every building. This is something that's not science fiction. There's work that's, uh, that's been done out of Los Alamos National Lab, out of Los, Al Los Alamos National Lab that is, is coming to fruition. But more importantly, the science that's coming out of this can also be applied to replenishing uh, in terms of synthetic soils and other consumptive fixative uses. Resource depletion. Due to our overutilization of non-renewable sources, whether we're talking about fossil fuels or minerals and 